that somebody should let him in mehul are are you saying anything hello yeah he is a host he should be in uh no he is asking that is not allowed ask ask john to join on the 10:30 uh, link then uh, i think no permission would be required yeah calendar link yeah he might be trying on the web link i think yeah let's as, as I, I, it's 10:55 shall we start webinar should uh -huh. i go on that And then uh, yeah. chat, that's okay. You can chit chat for five minutes. We can wait for John. We can assist him. That should be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Fine. We're clicking on start webinar. We are going on mute. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. I clicked on start webinar. I see people are joining in now. So that's cool. Great. good morning everyone thanks for joining a uh, little early it is always good to test if everything is working fine uh, we will start sharp at 1101 thank you we'll be on mute till then and from the from the participants can somebody go into chat and okay yes i can see a chat out there i can thank you vasant sir good morning umesh ji good morning anish bhai good morning great i wanted to ensure that the chat is working for everyone so that's great thank you good morning everyone vijay ji dipesh ji <clears throat> you guys see my screen right uh, from the audience if somebody can confirm you see a slide uh, introductory slide great thank you cool Hello. Hey John, how are you? Not good. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell I was surprised that okay, are you able to join or not? Um so John, do you want to test your screen sharing? Shall I shall I uh, share the screen? Yeah, hold on. So yeah, the, I I mean, this has been hell because honestly, I was rebooting my computer to make sure that everything would be fine and then mm -hmm. it just completely crashed and wouldn't start again. Um and the only way I can't for some reason I can't I'm trying to join on my wife's laptop on Zoom and just not let me join. So mm -hmm. I might have to do actually do it from my phone. Okay. Um, so yeah, so yes, yeah, so let's try this. Let's see if I can share from my phone and then we'll go from there. Sure. So I will stop sharing. Maybe you can start to share yours and let's see if it works. Yep. Okay. 
Oh my God. I've never done this from the phone, so hold on, bear with me for a sec. Good luck. <laughs> I think Mihul, do you have John's presentation with you as well? If you can share the screen and John can uh, articulate that. Uh, no, it's with John. Yeah, just give me a sec guys. I'm trying to get the stupid thing connect. Oh my God, seriously. No, I don't want to do it this way. I think what I might have to do is actually just share my phone screen. Let me try that. God, this is a nightmare. Can you see anything right now? Not yet, John, not yet. So I think I think uh, it is already 11.01. So maybe we should start with Dr. Arun's session first. And then uh, meanwhile, John, you can fix your issue. Is that OK? Or Yeah, go for it. I mean, I'll, I'll see what I can do here. Cool, cool. I just I don't even know how to do this on my phone, to be honest. Yeah, let's try it out. Let's see. So it is 11.01, guys. We will wait for one more minute, and then we'll start. Okay, guys, so I see about 96 people right now. Uh, I'm sure people, more people will join because we had about 245 registrations. So uh, with that, good morning, everyone. Good evening, John. Let's get started. So thanks for joining this weekly webinar of Elite CISO. Today, we are going to cover two topics. One is going to be around the technical subject, which is five signs you are about to be attacked, which will be covered by John. And then we will also have a leadership talk by Dr. Arun. So this is how the schedule is going to look like uh, quickly. So uh, it's a quick introduction, 11.00 to 11.05, which is a welcome note. And then 11.05 to 11.35, uh, we were supposed to have the technical talk, but I think John is having some issues with his laptop. So we will switch to Dr. Arun's uh, technical talk first, which is invoking the champion in you. And then later, once Dr. Arun finishes, we will go to John for the technical talk. And then after that, once the technical session and the leadership session is done, at 12 o'clock, we will have a Kahoot quiz. And the quiz is based on the, the discussion we are going to have. So there'll be about six to seven questions, three questions from the technical side, three or four questions from the uh, leadership talk uh, by Dr. Arun. And then at the end, uh, like up after the Kahoot quiz, we will also have a Wheel of Fortune as we run every time in our webinars. And we will also have CPE certificate, uh, which you can uh, download as a, as, a, as a certificate for your participation. Now, as Kahoot quiz, the winners will get the smart weighing scale. Those will be five in unit. So five people will get that. And one person will get a nice sound bar. Uh, most of the people say that most of the time that we do only one uh, giveaway. So this time we have two giveaways. One is the soundbar and the other one is going to be Amazon Alexa. So in total, we have a lot of uh, uh, gadgets this time. We have five weighing machine, one soundbar, one Amazon Alexa. I think a lot of people who say that they don't get lucky, they will get lucky today. Great. With that, let me pass it on to Dr. Arun. So Dr. Arun, over to you. 
I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours. Go ahead, please. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's glad to be connecting with all of you CIOs. My name is Arun Bhardwaj. In my previous life, which was probably 2016 and before, I was interacting with CIOs in a different capacity. I was working with companies like Motorola, Samsung, uh, Lucent Technologies, and Dell, and helping CIOs enable the infrastructure. Today, I'm in a different role. And as I love to call CIOs, Chief Innovation Officers, I would like to contribute a little bit on the inner front, and we will get started with that. <laughs> that was not low battery on my laptop. See, when these days our phone or laptop shows low battery, we run towards the power socket as if our life depended on those devices. But when was the last time we did that? same thing to our own self. These days, all of us are very up to the mark. We know exactly which operating system is getting released, which patch I have to upgrade on my phone. Even those folks who are not technical, they also know that they need to apply latest patches to get the best features possible. They need to apply patches, security patches, so ransomware and other viruses do not attack their phones and laptops. But what about our own self? When was the last time you upgraded your own operating system? So as this technical session had to start with how to prevent ransomware, I'm going to share something more exciting and equally interesting, how to protect your inner self with those ransomwares and viruses. And as SOFOS helps UCIOs protect your cyber environment, my intent today is help you with a different kind of IT. So as you are keeping your environment safe with products like Sophos suite of products, I'm helping you with the ideas for inner transformation that directly helps you address the most important hyper-converged infrastructure, which has 85 billion neural CPUs, one exaflop of processing power, and 2.5 petabyte or more of storage. I'm pretty sure you have guessed which infrastructure I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about you. Now, interesting part about being me and you, we have the most sophisticated hyperconverged infrastructure right within us. But the challenge is you cannot hardware upgrade it. You cannot put more memory chips. You cannot increase by increasing number of CPUs. And that's good and bad. Bad because we have a limitation of our hardware, but good thing that we are all, all born with the same hardware, same two kidneys, one heart, one brain, two lungs, etc., etc. We have the same hardware. Now, where is the magic factor then? What separates good from great? What makes simple players the difference between simple players or good players and champions? And that's something that I would like to reflect upon with all of you today. So you can go from good to great. And that X factor, ladies and gentlemen, is our inner operating system. So we are all limited by the hardware that we, have, we are born with. But this inner operating system is so versatile, so programmable, so flexible, which can make the difference between good and great. And I hope in two sessions that I'm going to have with you, the session today and session in the new future, probably in, sometimes in May, I will be able to take you on this journey of how to first gain better understanding of our inner operating system and then learn to program it, learn to fine tune it so you can maximize outcome from your inner operating system. And what is it? This is the tool that we all are gifted with. So the kind of body we got, the hardware we have, that is our fate, where we were born, how we were born, et cetera, et cetera, that's our fate. But what we do with that fate is our destiny. And the logic or the programming that we can do is that inner operating system. And when I'm talking about inner operating system, 
just to simplify it, I'm talking about the way we think, feel, and act, the world within. And that world within, how we think, feel, and act, that creates our personality. And I want to invite you to think that our personality creates our personal reality. The outcome in our life, how our life becomes, what our destiny becomes, is actually shaped by how we think, feel, and act. So if we have to change our external personal reality, we have to change our personality, the way we think, feel, and act. So creating your destiny, the desired destiny is all about maximizing your inner operating system performance. How do we do it? I'm going to borrow, I have borrowed a few terms from sports to me because two different worlds, whether you're a corporate athlete or you're a sports athlete, we have the same magic factor that helps you to become champion. And that magic factor, can you guess? Can you type it in the chat box? What do you think is the difference between a normal player? In fact, two great players playing that final in terms of their skills, domain knowledge, etc., practice, they've all done 10,000 hours. What is that magic factor, that X factor, that's going to decide if one person wins or the other person wins, right? So let me see what you have typed, what you're responding with. Uh, let me open the chat. Speed, strength, mental strength, timing, passion, uh, consistency, framework, very good. I think all relevant answers. I want to highlight on one champion's mindset. It is the mindset that makes all the difference. That day, the person who is there, gone with the positive mind, without stress and strain, without anxiety and regrets, will become the champion that day. And that's what champion mindset is all about, ladies and gentlemen. Champion's mindset is mental ability to perform at your personal best on a consistent basis, regardless of the circumstances. And consistent and regardless of the circumstances, just underline that. And that's what I talk about when I talk about champion's mindset. And invoking the champion in you is about invoking that mindset in you when you can perform at your personal best on a consistent basis, regardless of the circumstances. How do we do it? Now, in the technical domain, <laughs> I often tell that you know for 25, 30 years, I was designing and engineering electronic circuits. And now I'm engineering happiness. For us to do our best, we have to create an environment of joy because when we are happy, we are at our best. And for that, if you want to fine tune your infrastructure, you need to understand the architecture. You need to understand how the operating system works. You need to understand what are some of the knobs of that operating system that can help you maximize performance of that operating system. So let's understand our iOS and I'll take you on a visual journey. Ethiopia, 3.2 million years ago. On two legs. This is fascinating, and I'll tell you why. This is evolution. This is a story of evolution of our inner operating system. And Lucy, that's that skeleton named as right now, we believe she was the first human ancestor that started walking on two feet. I think she was the mother of innovation. <laughs> Why? Because she did something no, no one of her species did before her. She took risk, she jumped off, she was creative. She said that I cannot survive on trees anymore, I have to start walking on the floor. And she started taking risk. And next three million years, we evolved from that, that tree dwellers to what we have become now. And that evolution has significant impact on how we think, how we feel, and how we behave. That's why I think this event in our human history is very, very significant. Now, next three million years, most of our fight was fight for survival. And because of that, over three million years, this brain, that is our uh, the, the most potent, most powerful organ probably of all the species, it evolved to help us survive and thrive. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we grew right from Australopithecus that uh, Lucy was to Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, those who started walking straight and Homo sapiens, which are considered the last of the ape series and then we became human beings. Now, if you see the shape of the forehead, you will see that the forehead was flattened 
and it started rising as the brain size increased. That means everybody has three different brains. One is the animal brain that all animals have. It's also called lizard brain or crocodile brain. Uh, that helps us with the survival. That's where most of the sensory information comes first. Second, we have emotional brain that most of the mammals have. But humans are blessed with this frontal cortex, which is the front end of the brain, which is very latest, last few thousand years. And that's the thinking brain or executive brain that we have. Why I'm saying all this? Because I think this is the beauty. Human beings are unfinished product of evolution. See, any animal, you can see their babies, they stand up and start moving around in next couple of hours of birth. In fact, they start finding and catching their food in next few weeks, if not in next few months. But human babies, totally dependent on parents for next many years, especially first two years. Now, good and bad, because this is what creates magic in the human domain. When babies are born, they are born with a default configuration. They are born with gray matter, but not much of processing programming into it. And gradually, we get our upgrades. And that's where story of inner operating system begins, which is very, very important to understand. So what is the takeaway from here? Human babies are the unfinished product of nature. And it is up to the society, parents, and the structure we have created that develops our brain into sophisticated, powerful tool that we all are carrying today. So let's go to the journey of iOS, iOS beta version. Inner operating system we are born with. This is our default configuration. We can call it our BIOS, basic inner operating system. And then the kid starts seeing things, cannot talk, does not have power of language, but he starts observing things. So his social, his or her social conditioning starts happening. And the baby gets iOS 1.0 upgrade. After that, kid starts interacting with the environment because now he or she, they have power of language and we start learning indirectly. And that is our upgrade iOS 2.0. Quite a significant jump because in 1.0, we already know about things. We do not know the logic behind them. We have taken a lot of pictures. That's why when baby starts talking, they talk a lot and they ask a lot of questions because they are pictures. They don't know what these pictures mean. And then the most significant upgrade in the youth, in the, in the teenage, from 2.0 directly to iOS 4.0, direct learning. Now, not only they are learning from school and college and parents, they are also experiencing life and upgrading themselves. And our iOS starts learning about the world, how to react, how to respond, what is dangerous, what is not, what you can do, what you should not do, etc. And from that 4.0, many times, I don't think we upgrade ourselves a lot. And that's why I think it's important to understand about iOS. So what is this iOS? What's the importance in our life? I think you might have now understood how this inner operating system grows from default BIOS, which has very minimal functions, primarily survival functions. And by the way, an interesting bite. When we are born, we are born with almost no fear. Only fear we have is fear of sound. Rest of the fear, those are the viruses that are conditioning, environmental conditioning, parents trying to scare us so we don't go out in the dark, etc. They fill our mind with. So only fear you have originally in your bias is fear of sound. That's to protect you. So bias is all about keeping us safe and helping us survive. The rest of the conditioning happens with the environment giving these details to us. So what is this mindset or inner operating system? It is how we perceive life events, how we feel about them, how we respond to them. So whenever something happens, we immediately process it and we have all these stories that in our iOS now, 4.0, 4.x, and we interpret information. And based on that interpretation, we have feelings and based on feelings, we act. Let me give you an example what I'm talking about. These days we have matches going on, India versus England. Now, suppose India is playing very well. Now, same situation, but because your iOS says it is my country, my country is playing well, suddenly you feel sense of pride, you are feeling good, you have positiveness, elation. What will happen at the same time to folks or English fans? They are not feeling so good because India is beating them up, right? So their action would be unpleasant, turn off the TV. Same situation because your iOS has a different story for you. You are feeling good, your action is shouting, elating and you know, telling your friends about how India is winning the matches. And uh, our actions create experiences that creates our feelings. And if we are feeling good and happy, we will be doing our best. So this is the logic. Our inner operating system that we have accumulated, 
that makes all the difference. I'll give you one another very interesting practical example. In your neighborhood, somebody starts breaking the house next door. Not able to, uh, you're not able to sleep because it's very noisy. You go and complain to the contractor, and the contractor says, "Sorry, sir, this was supposed to be a surprise, but because you're not feeling happy about this noise, I have to tell you, one of your aunts, far off aunts, she has nobody else, so she has decided." to buy this next door house for you and we are breaking it and constructing a very new house for you. Now the same noise will sound like music to you because suddenly the context has changed. Your interpretation of the same event has changed. After a few days, doorbell, the contractor comes in and says, sir, we committed a dire mistake. We had a problem. Actually, it was not your aunt, but the neighbor on the other side. And suddenly the same hammer starts becoming intolerable to you again, just the way interpretation changes. Now, that's, that's, that's about all the theory. Now we'll do some fun exercises because I want to share with you as we conclude the first session, what is our iOS design features? Because as you're all technology folks, you know, unless you understand what is the design feature of the operating system, what are some of the knobs, what is the reason for no knobs, what can you do changing those knobs, we'll not be able to put our inner operating system in the peak performance mode. So what are some of the iOS design features? First one, our brain is designed to prioritize survival. Our brain was never designed to make us doctor, engineer, CIOs and all that. It was designed to help our species survive. Not only you, individually, it doesn't care. Help the species survive. The second iOS design feature is, and we are going to experience these design features, so stay with me. Minimize energy use. If you can just go by thumb rules and not spend too much of energy. Save your energy, conserve your energy for survival, for number one. So minimize energy use. And we will see what kind of complications we get into because of that. Number three, imagination is equal to reality. The most sophisticated stimulator, simulation engine is within our mind. We can see things. We can, we can come up with things that we have never seen in our life. So we can simulate, stimul we have the simulation power. Unfortunately, we use that simulation power for wrong reason, causing us anxiety and grievances, etc. And fourth, neurosciences. So this is a very good essence of neurosciences that I'm blending with the practical life experiences for you. So neurons that fire together, wire together. In simple language, practice makes a man perfect. More you practice something, more it's going to ingrain in your mind. Good as well as bad, both things can get ingrained into your mind. So let's experience some of these features. Prioritizing survival, 3 million years of evolution, we only had two things, fight or flight. We had to catch food. If the animal was small, we will fight and kill that animal so we can get lunch. Because if it is a larger animal, if we try to fight, we can become lunch. So in that case, we will flight. So we only had brain designed for these two things, fight and flight. And that causes problem because brain is designed to see fear as false evidence appearing real. That means even if it's a rope in the dark, your brain is designed to see this as a snake because everything on the negative side is better because if you think it is a snake and it happens to be rope, you're okay, you're survived. But if it is snake and you think it is a rope, you are going to be toasted, you'll be in trouble. So brain is designed to help you survive. And that's why we are very risk averse. We don't want to take risk, that's why. If you make money in stock market, you will probably forget it within a few weeks or month. But if you lose money, we are going to remember it forever. We are more motivated by pain than gain. That's about, uh, that's about fight and flight or our first thing. Now, the challenge in today's time, what causes depletion of our resources and causes a lot of stress, fight and flight is not an option many times for us. So our brain is designed for fight and flight, but that's not an option. Why? Uh, if you are talking to your spouse and you are having a tough time talking to her or him, neither you can fight sometimes nor you can flight. So what do you do? We have adapted to a new response as human being, freeze. Same thing happens in office environment also. Sometimes you want to run away. Your basic instincts are getting activated. You want to fight or flight, but you can't do either. So you freeze and that causes stress. Same thing with the traffic, same thing when somebody backbites you. So that's why this freeze response has become reason for our stress and depression quite a bit. So what is the fourth F? Fight, flight, freeze. It is face. 
how do you face the situation and come out of it without feeling depressed and stressed we'll talk about it in the next session so i'm going to go to the second minimize energy use that's the second design feature lazy brain works on thumb rules if it is not important ignore if it is risky avoid let's do one exercise look at this picture on the screen do you see anything wrong with it people smiling now i'm not going to change this picture what i'm going to just do is turn this picture upside down so i'm just rotating it not changing the picture and i hope you'll have a chuckle this is how actually this picture is but your brain did not want to spend too much of energy constructed the right image once again this is the image when i turn it upside down this is how the image is so your brain likes shortcuts and that's why many times you get into trouble having this awareness i hope you'll be able to reflect on your next decision makings and when you're interpreting data understanding that brain can lead you and your team member your family members into these shortcuts of thumb rules next one let's do this i would like there is a poll question after this so listen to this please if bat plus ball is 1100 rupees and the bat costs 1000 rupees more than the ball how much does the ball cost i want instinctive response i want immediate response i am launching the poll let's see what your response is okay i'm launching the poll now let's see what is your response instinctive response okay great i have some unusual answers also which i usually don't get great 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 so three two one and we are talking about thumb rules we are talking about how brain conserves energy and if you can find some easy method it can lead to very interesting results so would 72 percent people said 100 rupees and then a few people said uh, 200 and 15 percent said 50 rupees let's see let's see what happens here see this is the magic i want to share with you i think this course should be taught in high school because if we know about inner operating system life will become so beautiful and easy and we'll get less problems in our life now, what you have, most of you have said 100 rupees, right? Did your ball say 100 rupees? Yes. Let's look at it. If ball is 100, then bat is 1000 rupees more, that means 1100, and total will become 1200 rupees. That would be wrong. That equation would not be equalized. So, what is the answer? 50 rupees. Because if ball is 50, bat would be 1050, and total would be 1100. So, don't feel bad. Don't start believing you don't know mathematics. This is how average. 80% people answer it and this is just to realize that our brain finds quick, quick, quick thumb rules. <laughs> I'll tell you how it is being utilized in marketing and branding. Once I was buying watermelons and I asked this person, I said, hey, I don't know. My dad wanted me to get a sweet watermelon. I do not know how to get it. Can you please find one beautiful sweet watermelon for me? So he goes and knocks and knocks and finds out and gives one and says, this is going to be sweet. So I saw him use, using this method of knocking and giving the best sweet watermelon. So I asked him, how do you find out? What is that you're, are you listening to the sound or knock or what is it? He says, sir, that I do not know. My dad taught me whenever somebody asks for a sweet watermelon, just knock on two and give them the third one they feel happy. And we do feel happy. And that's how these thumb rules are being utilized in marketing and branding sometimes. <laughs> the third design feature is imagination is equal to reality. Brain does not know the difference between if you are imagining something or are you really doing something. First scan, brain scan you see is a person playing piano. And the second one is a person actually just thinking about playing piano. And the same regions of brain are activated. What I mean by that? If you're thinking negative, you start behaving negative. Don't believe me? Okay, let's try this out. So all of you in your offices or home, home offices, wherever you are, just clap once. Join me this. This is an interactive exercise, so join me once. So clap once. And now, just like we point that gun with the fingers, open your fingers, bring them to your eye level, and just say, stay open, stay open, stay open, stay open, stay open, stay open. In your mind, you don't have to even say loudly. 
You're just bringing a thought, an idea into your mind. Okay, so it stayed open. Let's do one more clap. Once again, same thing. And this time say, come closer, come closer, come closer, come closer, come closer, come closer, come closer. Just look between your fingers and in your mind, not even loudly, just say come closer. If you're a normal brain processing human being, your fingers might have come closer or touched each other. Just a thought. That means your cells, your body, your mind is eve teasing on your thoughts. When you're thinking negative without you even knowing, subconsciously you start acting negative. If you meet somebody and say, I don't like you, I hate you, I hate you, you are going to communicate that. The other person is going to understand and realize that. So think positive. Be careful because mom can start communicating through Bluetooth connection of your own. I call it iOS's Wi-Fi connection. And fourth one, neurons that fire together, wire together. Very simple. If you cons consistently think of a thought, that thought is going to become permanent idea in your mind. For example, if you keep thinking about this session today, I'm going to rent some space in your mind now. There'll be certain circuits in your mind that will be created to form an idea called Arun in your mind. Okay, and if you keep thinking about this session today, I'm going to become a permanent memory in your mind. So what I'm saying today, you are all going to biologically, physically going to change because so far you had no idea who is Arun Bhardwaj. You had no idea about iOS and all these related concepts. And when you are listening to me, new neural connections are getting formed and you are not the same anymore. So more you use these thoughts, if you share it with your family and friends or kids, it's going to become even more pakka. Neurons that fire together, wire together. They are going to become big permanent concepts. Okay. Finally, can iOS be hacked? Now, all of you are CIOs. We are talking about Sofo. Sofo is the cybersecurity expert. They stop ransomware and all kinds of these virus attacks that can harm your environment. But can inner operating system be hacked too? Let's see an example. Between these two pictures, which orange dot is bigger? Save time, just to save time, I don't have a poll question, but if left one was A, right one was B, which one is bigger? Can you type it on, on the, on the chat? Most of the people, most of the people, right side, B, yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of you who know probably, or you are not using your brain, but your past experiences are saying both are same. You are right, actually. But look at this. So that means brain can be hacked easily. We are processing everything in the relative environment. It's called relativity bias or referencing bias. See, both were same, but look at this. The left one looks smaller, right one looks bigger. Why am I sharing this with you? When next time somebody says something that you don't agree, don't say to the other person you are wrong because you both might be right or both might be wrong. It is just a matter of perspective, how things are being processed. I want to leave you with one amazing experience. And there's a poll question on this. What do you see this dress as? What is the color of this dress? White and golden or blue and black? And I'm going to launch a poll on this. What is the color of this dress? It is a fascinating example of how iOS comes into action and we need to know about it to live a happy and joyful and successful life. So, uh, please start responding. Uh, are, you, are you able to see? No? Okay, just a minute. Let me relaunch the poll. Okay. So if you can please respond. Do you see it white and golden or blue and black? Now, it, this, is, this is fascinating. This is fascinating. You will see, wow, how two people can see the same dress of two different colors. But that's the magic of being human and having our iOS. Now, let me end this poll in the interest of time and share results with you. 80% thinks it's white and golden, 20% think it is blue and black. I'm pretty sure those 20% are saying, what the heck, how can you see it white and golden? Those of you who are seeing it white and golden are saying, what the heck, how can it be blue and black? Huh. So Hans question is, uh, what is actually the right answer? Uh, interestingly, this is a dress it is called the dressed, if you search on Google, divided the whole world into two parts, white and golden, blue and black. Half the people saw it white and golden, half the people saw it blue and black. And it depended on 
Are you a night owl or a morning lark? Do you wake up and stay more in the natural light or do you work mostly within the room in the dark light? And based on the kind of environment you have lived, if you stay more in the natural light, our eyes, our iOS filters out blue color light and you will start seeing things more white. Actually, this dress is blue and black because the manufacturers talked about that they don't have a white and golden variant of this dress at all. And you can search, it's a philosophy by itself. But uh, what I'm trying to tell you with this, that our inner operating system can process information very differently based on those upgrades that we have received in our iOS as we grew up from indirect learning, direct learning. So when next time you have difference of opinion, remember these two experiments and remember that both of you might be wrong, both of you might be right, or one person may be right or wrong, doesn't matter. It's interpretation of data, and our iOS does it very differently based on the kind of relationship we had with the environment and everything else. So what I'm leaving you with, what is the takeaway? We have two options. Our brain is designed for survival, for instinctive reactions, for handling things using thumb rules, for you not to go out of your comfort zone because then it's risky, so you should not create, you should not innovate, just say, do things that are safe and you have experienced before. That would be living by default. That's what our default system is designed for, as you saw today. And you saw that even for very simple things, we can get tripped. That would be living like in a boat, living our life like a boat, where you are moving with the wind, with the waves. But I invite you to think different. Now that you understand design architecture of your brain, I hope you will be able to live life like a sailboat. So when even it is adverse situation, you'll be able to align your sail and utilize adversities for your advantages. How to do it? That would be topic for the next talk. And I would invite you to think that other than being great as technology folks, we have to be happy. We have to enjoy what we are doing because when we are happy, we are at our best. And happiness leads to success a lot more than success leads to happiness. As all of you are CIOs or CIO office folks, make sure your teams are delighted. They are enjoying what they are doing and they are happy because when they are happy, productivity and their performance and engagement, everything increases. Can happiness be engineered? Yes, that's what I spent 10 years. I've done my research. My PhD topic was happiness and ancient wisdom. I'll share some of the learnings when we meet in our next session. So it's a journey of inner transformation. Today we learned about what inner operating system is and what are some of the challenges, how, to, how these uh, inner operating system gets affected by the threats that are around us. And in the next session, we are going to go from managing threats to creating delight. How do we upgrade our inner operating system? By installing happiness passage, uh, patches for a happier life, installing new habits to patch iOS vulnerabilities. So. Uh, it is a pleasure interacting with all of you. If you have uh, any question, I do not know if we'll have a question answer time, but uh, pleasure interacting with you. Please leave your thoughts on the chat box. Uh, my mission in life is to help you uncover greatness within yourself and leave you happier than I found you. And I hope I was able to deliver on my mission. Thank you very much and back to you, Vivek. Great. Excellent, excellent session, Dr. Arun. Lot of appreciation in our WhatsApp group and people are already looking for next session. So great, great talk. Thanks a lot. And with that, over to John. Thank you. And as good IT professional, everybody should have a backup. And John also has a backup. Uh, and I think he's up and running and fixed the issue with his laptop. So over to you, John. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was a, a bit of a shock today when I went to boot my laptop and it wouldn't boot. So uh, let me just pick what I want here. All right. So uh, hi, everybody. Sorry, I couldn't uh, speak first this time as, as was planned, but uh, obviously um, you know, things happened and uh, we, we made the best of it. So what I want to talk about today is, uh, you know, the, the talk is five signs you're about to be attacked, but what, what where this is coming from is going to be some research from our rapid response group um, that led to these five indicators that whenever we see these things in a network, you know, at any point, they, it really means that there's an attack that's imminent. Um, and what I'm going to cover today is going to talk about some different groups, uh, how they operate, some of the tools that they use, and some of the, the, evolving, tac the evolving tactics. And then finally, what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to um, talk about maybe some ways that you can maybe prepare yourself or, or how, how to defend against these types of things. So if we look at the three different groups that are, you know, we can broadly sort of slice them up. You've got your nation state. So going from left to right on the screen, you've got your nation state act actors, you know, your um, uh, some of the, and some of the higher end sort of APT groups. Then you've got uh, the other, other APT groups in organized crime. So there's in this, you know, lots of specialists. There's they 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 have um, uh, different groups that are responsible for different uh, parts of the the attacks. And then finally, at the very um, uh, right side of the screen, you've got your sort of cut and paste script, script kitty type people, right? And the thing that we need to to really bear in mind when we're talking about attackers is that. The, the tactics and the tools that these people use, they kind of move from left to right. So as the nation states develop uh, uh, exploits, as they develop tools, some of these things start to filter down. But what we've also seen is that a lot of the, uh, the middle guys, the, the, you know, the organized crime people, they're also doing a lot of this tool development, this exploit development as well. But that's all ending up in the hands of the script kids, the people who really don't have the skills to pull any of this off themselves, but they benefit from the actions of these other people. And so, Let's kind of break it up into uh, a couple phases. I'm going to talk about initial access. We're going to talk about you know the five signs, and uh, and obviously you know we're going to talk about ransomware because that's that's the big the big threat these days that you know nobody can can run away from. Um, and you know I start this by talking about something that just happened recently, right? The Hafnium attacks. So we're talking here about organized um, uh, nation state attacks against uh, who you know exploited these exchange these four exchange servers zero day vulnerabilities, and uh, managed to break into a whole bunch of organizations. And you know, this is an example of what happens when you've got really highly skilled, well-funded, well-resourced, patient type of, of attackers, they can do this kind of thing. But the reality is most of us, the most of the people that are out there you know, going on their day-to-day -day business aren't necessarily a target of these guys. This is usually nation state on nation state, or you've got nation states going after very large organizations, multinational organizations, uh, defense contractors, those kinds of things. And so this, while it is a uh, an area of concern, isn't really what we're focusing on on a day-to-day -day basis. What we're looking at in terms of initial access is, you know, there's three things. I break it down into three things. I break it down into the, the different vulnerabilities that are not these zero days, but the ones that are just coming out every single week, uh, every single month that, you know, we get bulletins on. And this is, you know, the, the bulletin from this past week, uh, which was released uh, by the um, Department of Homeland, Homeland Security, had, you know, they score their vulnerabilities the, uh, based on the severity of this particular vulnerability and 97 of them were actually scored there was a whole bunch that weren't scored but of those 20 were medium 71 were high and six were low so you've got you know two-thirds of those well out of the 97 you've got 90 91 of them are medium uh, and, and and above right so that that's a big problem and if you look at the top 15 vulnerabilities that um the department of homeland security they, they did analysis they said okay what of all these vulnerabilities that came out last year the top 15 that were used, you know, 13 of 15 of them, all they required was an update or an upgrade to actually solve and mitigate the issue. So to be to no longer be vulnerable to that uh, particular uh, um, uh, vulnerability, you have all you had to do is patch. And then of two of the other, the, the remaining 15, uh, it was essentially following best practices. So configuring the, the software properly as opposed to just like, picking defaults, right? So there's a lot of stuff that um, gets exploited because of uh, either people aren't patching fast enough or they're just not bothering to configure the, the software uh, well enough. And then you've got email, right? Email is still the number one vector, threat vector for, um, for malware getting onto uh, to networks. And then on the right-hand side is RDP. That's just another, you know, or it's a stand-in for exposed remote services, right? This could be VPNs, that could be, uh, uh, this could be things like, um, VNC or, or any other kind of remote services, but RDP is kind of the big one. You've got 3.7 million, this is a showed in the search I did, you got 3.7 million exposed hosts on the internet right now that are exposing RDP, which basically means that there's 3.7 million targets. But are there really? Because if you think about what RDP does is it allows you to get onto a machine, which then gives you access on the internal network to a lot more machines. So that 3.7 million could actually be 10X, 100X, 1,000X. We don't know, right? How many other machines can you get access to by breaking into one machine? And 
you, you don't really need to have a lot of skills to do this kind of stuff because if you go on the dark web, you can find portals like this where they actually sell access to already um, compromised servers. And you can see the price on the right hand side. So there's you know, some are nine, some are $11, some are $17. The reason they're, they're, they're different prices is because of these, there's different tiers where they get, they groom the access to the RDP servers. So if there's, you know, admin rights and you've got a direct IP, as you can see with some of the check marks there, that's actually going to affect the price. And, and uh, the people that break into these things, they groom them. They might even do um, establish additional points of persistence within the network, and they resell that kind of stuff to uh, to anybody who's got you know Bitcoin burning a hole in their pocket. And I did a, an analysis of some of our rapid response cases from last year, and in 77% of the attacks, RDP was either used for initial access or was used for lateral movement with, within the network. So RDP is a really big problem out there that's allowing cyber criminals to get into our networks and cause a lot of trouble. Um, as far as email being one of these you know, number one vectors, again, I, I don't need to be a super criminal in order to leverage these kinds of things. I can go onto another dark web portal where I can buy whatever I need. I can buy um, tutorials, I can buy tools, I can buy scripts, I can buy whatever I need to be able to launch a phishing campaign against you. And as you can see here, for you know, as low as $1, I can actually get some of these services up and running. And there's also the the criminal ecosystem that that likes to work together you know this organized crime uh, side of things and you know emotet this is sort of the poster child for for this kind of organized crime now emotet was taken down by law enforcement thankfully last year but the the I just like this infographic because it shows the relationships between the emitet, which is what's called a, a loader or a downloader. So this is the first thing that ends up on a machine. And then from there, it actually brings in other payloads, right? So it brings in banking Trojans and we, you know, there's Ursniff and QBot, TrickBot, Drydex, there's a whole bunch of them. And what those guys do is they actually steal, you know, financial credentials and, and try to do some sort of financial crime against you. And then once they're done ruining your your banking life, they go ahead and sell the access to the, the ransomware guys. So, you know, we, we saw this, these links every time we'd go into, a, into an engagement, we'd see, you know, it was Ryak ransomware that had hit the, uh, the, that had hit the victim. We could trace it back that, well, there's, you know, 99% of the time there was a trick bot infection. And before that there was an emotet infection. So these guys work really tightly together and they, they sort of sell and resell access to each other. And, um, and they're, they're really, they're an ecosystem. They're, they're a partnership on, on um, the, you know, on the, um, when it comes to cybercrime. Now, as I mentioned, the, the emotet has been taken down, but there's, you know, there's all cybercrime abhors a vacuum. So there's always ones that are waiting in the wings, ready to take over. And we've got things like Goot Loader, Bizarre Loader, Bureau Loader. There's all these other types of loaders and downloaders that are acting today. And as a matter of fact, the, the Revel ransomware crew has been associated recently with the Goot Loader guys. So, you know, this, these these relationships, even when one goes down, these, are, these relationships persist and uh, are able to cause a lot of damage. So, you know, I, I started talking about Hafnium at the beginning and how, you know, this is really kind of nation state sites to site type of stuff, but I also said that these things kind of filter down to the script kitties, right? And this is what we've seen just last week, we saw something called Deer Cry, which came, which came out and the Deer Cry is a, a piece of ransomware, but it, it appears to be created by a beginner. It's really unsophisticated. It does very little to hide itself from any kind of detection, you know, that strings are all in the, uh, in, in the clear. And, and so it makes it easy for, for detection. Uh, and one of the most notable features is if we look at the headers of the encryption, encrypted files, you can see that uh, on the left-hand side is Deer Cry, and the right-hand side is our good friend, Want to cry, right? So these things look really similar. And when you, you look at the code, you know, it, it, they, they look almost identical, which doesn't really seem like much of a coincidence. And so, you know, we think that th there might be some links between the, the want to cry attacks of a couple of years ago and the deer cry attacks as well. And then there was another one, yet another copycat, another opportunist but that, that um, came into play here. And following, and this was this week, we, we saw that. Um, you know, there's these people called Black Kingdom, and they started, we began detecting this um, last Thursday, I should say, March 18th. And uh, basically, they were also targeting the exchange servers. So not not only do the, the higher end guys target these, but now that the this flaw is out there and that everybody knows about it, these people, these, these criminals are starting to take advantage of this open hole. And, and it's the kind of thing that if you, you know, if you haven't patched yet, you know, you really need to get on it. But if you have patched, you also need to make sure that you haven't been already impacted by something like this because it doesn't close the hole retroactively. Um, and Black Kingdom is, again, one of these really unsophisticated 
pieces of malware that uh, it's really rudimentarily coded. It's very amateurish, and uh, but but it can still cause a, a lot of damage. And uh, and and this is apparently what, what we can tell is um, an offshoot of an earlier piece of ransomware that was also leveraging the Pulse Secure VPN vulnerabilities from last year. So these guys are just recycling vulnerabilities that other people are finding and are using that to get onto networks and to deploy ransomware. So let's talk about these five signs, right? These are the things that if you, know, you see these things in your network, there's probably some trouble ahead for you. And the first thing that you need to worry about or that you need to look for is a network scanner. And especially if it's a network scanner that exists on a server because the attackers typically start by gaining access to one machine and then they search for information, anything that they can find, like, you know, is this a Mac or Windows computer or what's the domain of the com company name? Do I have administrative rights? And you know, what other access do I have? And then next they wanna know, well, what else can I access on that network? And so one of the easiest ways to do that is to launch a scanner. And so if a network scanner, like, you know, angry IP scanner, advanced port scanner are detected on your network, it's really time to investigate. Obviously, you know, you wanna talk to your colleagues and say, hey, did you put a scanner in that server? If anybody says no, uh, if, if nobody says yes, and then, you know, everybody says no, then you really need to look into that because when we look at the tools that are being used by a lot of these ransomware criminals, network scanners are always among those tools. The second sign is tools for disabling antivirus software. So once these uh, admins get, you know, escalate their privileges and, and get admin rights on your, um, on your machines, they'll actually start to, um, they'll start using that software to try to disable any kind of security software or any other software that might get in their way. And so they'll you know, forcibly remove software using things like Process Hacker, IOBit Unstaller, PC Hunter, and, and these kinds of tools that are, you know, these are legitimate commercial tools. But again, and you know, it's one of those things with security, there's always a duality, right? There's the tools that can be used for good. So you can encrypt your data so that prying eyes and, you know, that you don't see it, but then criminals can use that same technology to keep you from accessing your own files. And so the same thing happens here is we need to understand how these tools are ending up on the systems. And if you didn't put them there, then you need to investigate. Now, one of the ones that I think is the biggest sign and, and, and is, should raise the, the most alarm bells is the presence of Mimikat anywhere. So Mimikatz is a tool that gets used by pen testers a lot, but it's also used a lot by cyber criminals. And it's a what Mimikatz does is it basically takes uh, credentials out of memory. It dumps credentials out of memory and allows you to then use those credentials for other things on the network for lateral movement and other privilege uh, escalation as well. Uh, you can also do offline um, attacks with Mimikatz. So you can use um, some uh, process explorer or you know that's included in Windows system internals to dump LSAS, which is the um, uh, the authentication system from, from Windows, create a dump file and then use Mimikatz to basically rip through that dump file and look for credentials. So, um, and a lot of times, you know, these uh, these criminals bring Mimikatz into the environment and, uh, and, and use that to get as many credentials as possible to establish as many points of persistence as possible and also be able to spread themselves far and wide. And so, um, you know, this is one of the tools that we, again, consistently see. But if, if you know, if nobody raises their hand and says, yeah, yeah, I'm using Mimikatz to test our systems to make sure that, you know, they're, they're secure, um, you need to really, really investigate right away. The next one is patterns of suspicious behavior. So things like, you know, detections happening at the same time every single day or in a repeating pattern. And, you know, those things are often indications that something else is going on. And even if a malicious file has been detected and then cleaned up, it doesn't mean that you're out of the woods because it could just be that these, um, uh, these cyber criminals are, are, are just working on their tactics. They're working on their, their lateral movement. They're working on um, the, the ability to um, do things on your network, right? And so security teams really should need to ask themselves as they see this kind of suspicious behavior, like why, is, why are these detections coming back every single day? Um, and you know, as incident responders, we know that when something like that keeps coming back, it's usually that something else malicious has been occurring in the network that hasn't yet been identified. So we're, we're, we're catching, you know, the products are catching something, but something else is going on. And a lot of this has to do with test attacks, right? So that's the final thing is if, you're seeing these test attacks on your network, like one here, one there. Um, what's happening is occasionally these attackers, they deploy or they, they, they do a test attack just to see how effective their deployment method and their ransomware 
uh, will execute and if it will execute successfully or if security stop, so, uh, software will stop it. And if it does, they kind of tweak things, they start over again. But what they also know is that this shows their hand. And so attackers know that once they do these test attacks, their time's now limited, but it's often um, you know, only a matter of hours from these test attacks to the actual full attack that gets launched. So if you see these test attacks, you, know, you, you really need to act right away because this, there, it, you could be minutes away from impending doom you know, with ransomware on your network, if um, if these te test attacks are left uh, left to, to go, uh, you know, un uh, uninvestigated, and so you know, with these five signs, like I said, these are the these five things that we see time and time and time again when we're helping victims of things like ransomware in our rapid response group. We're seeing these things over and over again, and you know, they're common to a lot of our victims. So you know, these are the kinds of things that you can instrument. You can you can start to add into the process of doing security in your environments that will help you detect things a lot sooner. So and, you know, I, with even within the, the, you know, the three tiers that we talked about, the nation state, the organized crime, the script kitties, there's also um, a lot of division there as well. So I'm gonna take so the, the, the right hand to boxes, the, the organized crime and the, the low skills guy, guys, right? You got low skill guys that are using things like ransomware as a service where you can buy into a service that allows you to de deploy um, ransomware, which is things like stop and Dharma ransomware. You've got other ones that are very heavily, heavy on the social extortion side of things, right? So, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's, you know, Riot, Revel, Doppelpamer. And then you've got the really sophisticated guys like Ragnar and, and Wasted Locker. Um, Speaking of Ragnar Locker, you know, the, the, just to give you an idea of the, the different ways that these guys, these groups operate, Ragnar Locker um, actually at one point was deploying a 122 megabyte hypervisor with a 282 megabyte Windows XP VM, all to hide and, and deploy a 49 kilobyte ransomware EXE. Um, so that's the lengths these these groups will go to to get stuff on the network they they figure well you know i'm not going to raise any alarm bells if i uh bring in this this vm hypervisor right and then and just launch that um and then launch my ransomware from inside that onto the network and one of these particular cases where we discovered this they uh, demanded 11 million dollars in, in ransom and these these are the kind of guys that we call big game hunters right they're after um they're after uh you know, they, they go after big companies, but they go after small companies as well, and, and they adjust their prices accordingly, and they try to uh, cause as much damage in a short period of time as possible. Um, and, you know, I, I, these guys are like criminal, pe professional criminal test pen testers, right? The only difference with these guys is they won't give you a nice glossy report at the end telling you, you know, all the ways that they broke into your network. They'll just send you a big, big old ransom note instead. Um, and then you've got groups like NetWalker, right? They, they use a blend of legitimate tools, publicly available software, like things like TeamViewer, uh, files that are customized from code repositories like uh, GitHub and their own bespoke PowerShell scripts. And, and they bundle all of this together to carry out their manual attacks. You know, most of the attacks that they do are what are called um, act automated active attacks. They use a little bit of automation, but then it's people hands on the keyboard that are actually doing the, the ultimate you know, next phases of, of these attack. And this group uh, has struck, you know, a whole bunch of different targets in the U.S., Australia, Western Europe, um, and they they prefer large organizations. And what's what's particularly repugnant about these guys is, you know, they were actually going after healthcare organizations uh, during the pandemic. And so w when a lot of these ransomware groups had at one point decided they weren't going to strike after. Um, uh, you know, pharmaceutical firms and, and healthcare uh, organizations, these guys didn't care. They just went after anybody. Um, and so what these guys do is they, they orchestrate these very well-designed manual attacks. They infil infiltrate and thoroughly recon their victims and their systems. They disable all the protection they can and before delivering the, uh, the final attack. And the, um, these guys, like I said, they rely less on self-made tools than some of the other ransomware groups, but they, you know, because a lot of their tools just come from the public domain, like I mentioned, you know, things like um, PS Exec, which is part of Sys Internals, and, um, and TeamViewer, and AnyDesk, and some of these other tools as well. And then finally, you've got the bottom end, you know, you've got the Dharma uh, ransomware as a service, and like I said, ransomware as a service is you can pay to sort of 
pay to play, right? You, you pay for a, a license, if you will, uh, and you get access to all the tools that these guys have. And, and what these guys have done is they've tried to make all the stuff that guys like Ragnar and some of the higher end, you know, uh, NetWalker, the, the types of ac- the attacks that those guys uh, do, they've tried to bundle that in, in easy to use, you know, Kind of paint by numbers toolkit right um it's just three screenshots from there they, they you basically buy this powershell script and you just start typing in numbers so option 32 launches the rdp client and option 52 launches uh powershell and you can see in the middle they've got mimi cats that's running as well so um these these guys also can can work with the, um, the 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 people on the criminal forums that sell you know RDP access right so they actually work in concert with those guys to to find to groom victims and find victims and as a matter of fact with this particular group um, eighty five percent of the Dharma attacks actually had RDP as their root cause um, and you know back in December two thousand and nineteen when the average ransomware demand was around one hundred and ninety one thousand dollars the average Dharma ransom demand was only like eight thousand dollars so um, you know that might seem like it 's a blessing in disguise but the reason that they're so low is because these guys, unlike the bigger guys that I mentioned earlier, these guys go after everybody. They go after small targets. They go after small businesses. They go after individuals. And they basically, they're making money on sort of a, a volume basis as opposed to the other guys who are sort of more of a, a qualitative thing, right? But basically, these guys are making up for the lower ransom demand with absolutely massive volumes. And they actually one of the most profitable ransomware families out there. And then something happened in 2019. We saw, you know, I talked about the social extortion earlier, and um, we started seeing Maze was doing this in, in, in the spring. And then we also saw another crew that basically held the city of Johannesburg uh, hostage by threatening to release data that they had stolen. They didn't, in this case, the ransom wasn't for data they had encrypted. They just stole data and said, we're going to release it. And then, you, know, you can imagine the types of data that a city will hold on its citizens, right? All sorts of financial data, all sorts of personal data. And uh, thankfully, the city didn't pay, and, and it seems like nothing came of it. But this gave other criminals an idea about what else they could do to sort of turn the screws on people and make it so that paying the ransom uh, was, was you know, a, a, maybe a better option um, because now you've got this extortion component. And the thing is, you know, there's never enough money for these guys. This is, I, I like this tweet that I saw um, last, last year, about a year ago last year, as you can see, May 13. Um, basically, this company paid the ransom, the 350000 to decrypt their files, but then they didn't pay again to delete the stolen files, right? So they keep coming back to the well. Um, we're, we're about to, to release a, a state of ransomware 2021 report. And I got a little, you know, a few little data points I want to share with you guys here. But, um, you know, in when, when the people who get hit by ransomware, um, we found that 96% of them got their data back through different means, right? It could be through backups. It could be through, uh, through paying the ransom. But what's really interesting is, um, out of those, you know, uh, out of those people that got hit by ransomware, 37% actually did pay to get the ransom. But the the interesting part is that only an average of 65% of people, uh, I'm sorry, only an average of um, of the people who paid the ransom, they only got an average of 65% of their data back, right? So they're not getting 100% of the, their data back. And this could be to a whole bunch of different things. It could be, you know, criminals that are are not honoring, you know, honoring their their business or technical difficulties or whatever but the, the fact is even if you pay the ransom you're not guaranteed to get all of your data back and so it really pays to have a plan ahead of time in order to uh, make sure that um, you're able to recover without having to pay and uh, this extortion thing has really taken off so here's a screenshot of one of the um, the uh, Avidon ransomware who, who runs one of these leak sites right so basically these these you know all this blurry stuff is all the people that they've they've breached and, and are, are leaking. Um, and, you know, the fact is almost all the popular and, and uh, most predominant ransomware families today have some sort of leak site. So that this whole extortion thing is, is actually really becoming a big business for them. And as a matter of fact, there was an interview with one of the Revel guys who basically said they're moving away from encrypting altogether. They're actually thinking to themselves, they don't need to encrypt anymore. What they need to do is just steal the, uh, the data and, and hold that to ransom. Hey, John, sorry to interrupt. We just have one more minute or maximum two minutes for you. Excellent. Yeah, okay. But yeah, we are running out of time. Yep, I'll move uh, very quickly. So I'll I'll take you through the, um, so so basically ransomware 
the cost of ransomware has really risen sharply in the last year. And in India, it's actually become a really big problem. As you can see, it's, uh, it's almost triple the, uh, the global average. So very quickly, I'll, I'll uh, talk about how you can defend against these things, right? You really got to th start thinking about zero trust or secure access service edge. This is the kind of thing that secures the user instead of the perimeter. So instead of just putting firewalls everywhere, you need to understand contextually what, what's happening in your environment. Um, you also need to create security cultures within your organizations, right? Make sure that the human sensors that are able to detect these attacks, like the phishing attacks that come in, that are the precursor to a lot of these things are, are always you know, on the lookout for, for things that can go wrong. You, know, you wanna prevent things first, but I've been saying, especially with the five signs that you need to detect and hunt things, right? So if you see Mimi cats, when did it get there? How did it get there? What other machines have it on there? If you're you're really operating blind, if you're not using uh, EDR. As a matter of fact, um, in the the rapid response engagements that I analyzed, the average dwell time, so that's the time that an attacker spends in your network before you notice, was 35 days. And with you know without things like EDR, you have no prayer of finding them uh, lurking around your network. And then finally, you need to have a, a plan for when a ransomware attack happens right so 22 percent of the people we surveyed know they have gaps and um and and this year uh you know 51 percent of the people surveyed said they had a plan and actually india was was one of the highest groups with 68 percent of people that had a plan for a ransomware attack and uh, that's a that's a really good thing but we need to get that number up to 100 percent so you know the there's time now to do make some incre incremental improvements as we're looking at defending against these ransomware criminals. Um, so you know, don't put off security to next month. Let's do it now. And uh, you know, the last closing slide here is going to be if you want to read more about some of these these stories, more details, uh, go read our threat report. Uh, Sophos Labs Uncut and Sophos News will give you all sorts of information um, about these these types of. Um, of campaigns that are happening, these, these new types of ransomware that we're seeing, and then uh, as well as the Naked Security and AI blog. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll pass it back to our host. Great, thanks, John. Really appreciate great insights around it. So we are running out of time. Uh, quickly over to you, Mehul. Can you introduce Sophos team and let's get through the uh, Kahoot quiz. Uh, thank you, Vikas Ji. So I have my uh, team member, Mr. Naveen who who will be the host as well and make you play the game i'll be just running at the back end and navin you can just have the commentary and uh, uh, tag him uh, uh, dr arun or john uh, wherever you find suitable i'm just sharing my screen yeah thank you mihul uh, thank you john thank you dr arun for the wonderful sessions and the wonderful insights about in inner operating system and uh, happiness and again you know how to protect network security protection against ransomware yeah, huge insights about i think on uh, technology front and the inner operating front uh, thank you so much i hope audience had enjoyed and uh, there is a you know good takeaways from the session for the audience yeah so we are all set for today's quiz uh, kahoot quiz you all know dot kahoot uh, type kahoot.it on your phone browser uh, it would be great if you're having two systems, like if you're joining on the phone or iPad, you grab another's phone and type kahoot.it on your mobile phone. Uh, uh, type your type the game pin 2512885 and just log in. I hope you all are familiar with Kahoot platform. Uh, there are only two things we need to focus. First, answer should be right. And second answer should be fast as soon as possible. So there are only two criterias to win the deals. And uh, we will make sure there will be there would be no question out of slavers. All the question will be from the session only. Great. Because you just heads up when we when I can start the game. Uh, because the 82, 84 has joined. Uh, when you confirm us, we will immediately start the session. So let, let it cross 100. Yeah. <laughs> we always love to make centuries. <laughs> That's how it is. Yeah, go for it now. Let's start. Uh, I think let's wait for a couple of seconds. Few. Uh, yeah, start. Yeah, Mule. Let's start. So this is the first question of the day. 
the early human ancestors believed to walk on earth was named as there are four options you might have seen this in dr arun's presentation uh, dr arun please is, free to chip in uh, if you feel like so it lets me you more somebody more is fun. asking pin in chat can you please mention in chat once again the pin game pin uh, it's too late for him <laughs> yeah 251 2885 it's there and on the, the right answer Bottom. is uh, just do see so so we so it is not probably the the ancestor but you know the earliest skeleton that we have seen and it is believed that this skeleton might have walked on two feet and that skeleton was considered one of the greatest find in archaeology and that skeleton is named as lucy thank you doctor sir uh, and we can see the winner and the number one position potan is there then fell kancha then anant anurup yeah next question uh, please mehul and the second question of the day is neurotons that fire together it was also well described by dr arun the presentation the benefits of that as well you have only 8 seconds uh, to answer the question uh, light up and grow create electrical signals wire together help you think and the right answer of the question is your wire together can you explain dr arun bhadwaj put some light over that sure so neurons that fire together wire together it's basically saying that if you keep walking on the path yeah, the the grass will not grow those paths will become more deeper same thing happens in our mind also so it works both for positive and negative thoughts when we allow certain thoughts to be rerun in our mind they will be, they they become part of our uh, inner operating system so whatever we think whatever we practice whatever we repeat be careful neurons that wire together fight to fight together wire thank together. you here comes the next question our ios is designed to respond rather than react uh, to and false there are two options only easy to answer I am expecting ninety-nine percent right answers over there. And the right answer is false. This is wrong thing. <laughs> This was a little bit of a trick question and purposefully given, so you can uh, fire wire, fire the right neurons so they can wire together uh, nicely. Uh, iOS is designed to react. and that is for good reason suppose you are driving a car and suddenly there is a ball in front you don't want to think oh there is a ball would there be a boy or girl behind it would there be a baby behind it what you want is if there is a, a sudden threat immediately without even knowing we press the brake and we stop so our evolution has designed our brain to be more reactive more instinctive that's why that parable of boat versus the sailboat and it is our thinking brain that helps us overcome that reaction circuits those instinctive circuits and form more responding or response oriented actions to anything that is happening in the environment in the next session when we talk about how do we utilize what we have learned today to create a happier life this reaction versus response will become one of the major way of creating a happier life so it was a trick question great those who got it right thank you dr sir and the score card is like uh, keep on changing gomit is first place now abhishek bansal is on second then rs uh, then basant followed by so first first and second are from yeah. delhi third one i don't know mumbai guys what are you doing okay. come on <laughs> <laughs> yeah next question please mehul uh, how can we program ios in a operating system uh, the i think in initial slides it was power of intention power of practice power of intention and practice then power of collaboration and the right answer is i'm aware with that power of intention and practice absolutely <clears throat> so i think most yeah. of uh, majority got it right power yeah. of intention is the key and we will, when we talk about mindfulness awareness they are also connected with this power of intention having our capability to design to fire specific neurons 
because we can fire specific neurons with our intention and with practice we can make them thicker highways in our mind so this is how we transform this is how we do it that is inner transformation so only now two questions are left to win that uh, kahoot quiz today's again our status is almost same gomit abhishek bansal am basant and followed by sks i hope uh, Oh, one comment, Basan sir run. He is expert in Kahoot and he runs Kahoot all okay. the time. So Basan sir, we are looking forward for you. Ah, uh, <laughs> so your expertise we have to see today as well, Mr. Basan. <laughs> so only two questions are left. Uh, let's not next one. What is the service for threat hunting which is led by experts called EDR, MDR, MSP, and SOC? Uh, you must be aware with EDR, Endpoint Detection and Response, MSP, Managed Service Provider, MDR, Managed Detection and Response, SOC. So, and the right answer for is MDR. I was not ex ex expecting wrong answer that much actually. Because now these days, MTR is the buzzword in market. Uh, so most of the OEMs are coming up with this service and so forth is also there with our MDR expertise where we are providing uh, 24 into 7 expert services to our customer to manage our proactive approach by our team. Oh yes, Mr. Basant has taken this seriously yes, and now yes, on yes, fire. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so things are changed now. <laughs> yeah, and the last and the final question of the day. Uh, Mule, which of the following is true? All malware are ransomware, all ransomware are malware, ransomware and malware are same. All malware gangs demand for ransom. A very tricky question and intelligent one. I think it can change the game. <laughs> and the right answer is all malwares are ransomware. So whatever they are the just categories only. Uh, so ransomware is one of the category, uh, you know, under malware umbrella. So all malwares are ransomware actually. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mehul. So now we can see the result and the podium of result today is on the third place, Mr. Kostu, I can see him. And the second one is Mr. Basant. And the winner of the day on the number one position of podium Gomit. is Mr. Gomit. Very, nice. Very good. That's Gomit, wonderful. Uh, Vikas, you must be aware with all the winners. I think uh, it will be yeah, easy. And to... we have fourth and fifth uh, Ashish and Abhishek. Ashish, what's the full, full name for Ashish? No worries, we will share you the complete list, Mr. Okay, Vikas. Okay, cool, cool, cool. We will share this complete list to you. Perfect, perfect. Let me share my screen now because we are. Yeah, now our here. time is for Wheel of Fortune. Right. So, guys, uh, I hope you see my screen. And if you want to get this certificate, the participation certificate for this session, go to Elite CISO's website, go to events, click on upcoming events, and then come to this SOFO session, uh, which we just attended today. Click on CPE certificate and fill your email address, your full name. And the secret to download certificate is, can you guess? It is IOS. That's what Dr. Arun wow. covered today. So all small <laughs> Very cases, good. Again, let me repeat. All small cases, not, not, not capital. First is not capital. Middle is not capital. I see all those errors every time. So it is all small case and you will get your certificate. Now, while you are here clicking on CPA certificate, as you know, every week we do these webinars and we have been doing every single week since March 2020. Uh, next week also, uh, we have a webinar on 1st of April. I'm not fooling you. So we have a webinar. It is not April's full prank. So uh, 1st of April on Thursday, we have a webinar with Fortinet. So you can go ahead and register for it as well. Now that everybody is kind of waiting for. So we had about 260, 265 registrations. All of them I've combined together, first name, last name, and company name. They are all put into this box over here. I'm going to spin the box. The first winner will get a sound bar and we will run it second time because a lot of people say that, okay, we need to increase the amount of awards. So that's how it is. And the next winner will get Amazon Alexa. Okay, guys, if, you are, if your name comes, go to the chat window and type yes, that you are there in this session. Okay, guys, going for it now.
All Let's... the best to all participants. So the first winner is good luck. Good luck. Madhvin uh, from Lumina Data Metrics. I think he is member of Chennai chapter. Uh, Mr. Madhvin, if you are there, go to the chat and type yes that you are there. I don't see you out there. Somebody is asking for password for certificate. It is iOS. It is there in the chat now. So Mr. Madhvin is not there. I'm going to spin it again and I will spin it only three times. If nobody comes, then we will move to the next one. Okay, let me see. I'm running it again now. And this time we have uh, Mr. Mohan, Mr. Ram Kumar Mohan from Bangalore chapter. Mr. Ram Kumar, are you there? Perfect. Congratulations, Dr. Ram, uh, Mr. Ram. Uh, uh, the soundbar goes to you. Wonderful, wonderful. Great. So I'm spinning it for the second time now for the Amazon Alexa. Mr. Kalyan from Chennai chapter. Mr. Kalyan, are you there? Oh, wonderful. Both of them are gone. Wonderful. Great. Yeah. Congratulations. Uh, I will sync with you offline and have it delivered to you. So uh, thanks everyone for joining in. Thanks Sophos team. Thanks Dr. Arun. Excellent session. And see you guys thank next week. You. Uh, thank you so much, Elite uh, Siso Club, Vikasji and all the participants here. Uh, if you have any query uh, related to technology and any other query related to solutions, Sophos product portfolio, you can reach out to me. Uh, my contact details are with Mr. Uh, Vikas. I think he can share in your internal groups. Sure. We'll yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Vikas. See you soon, very soon for the next session uh, where we are planning to do more and address the challenges now. How suppose can help you to mitigate the challenges and uh, whatever challenges or top five reasons to have the and ransomware protection and all we are going to cover in next session. And Dr. Bhadwaj also going to, you know, uh, give more overview to inner operating system enablement in ourselves, actually. Uh, thank you so much with this note. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye for now. Thank Thanks, Elite. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Bye.